The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Lord, be on my mind, be on my lips, be in my heart. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Ithurea and Traconis, and Lysanus was tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the desert. John went throughout the whole region of the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The winding roads shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Did you hear all those names? Tiberius, Caesar, Pontius, Pilate, Herod, Philip, Lysanus, Annas, Caiaphas, Luke, if you didn't notice, is a historian. And he is situating the gospel, the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus in history. It's important, right? Because it's easy for the world to believe that people like Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, Tiberius Caesar was the second Caesar, the second emperor of Rome, Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea, King Herod was a Jewish king but under control of the Roman Empire, Herod the Great was a Greek, his children uh, took over his four territories that were split up after he died, Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. The Jewish people were occupied by Rome, and so they had to cooperate with the Roman government. And so these two would head up the Sanhedrin. Annas was a high priest for a long time. He was the father of five other high priests, and Caiaphas was his brother-in-law. And so even though Caiaphas was the high priest, Annas, Annas still held the power or the influence. All that historical stuff that we have learned through other sources. One of the points of Luke doing this is so is John the Baptist, so is Jesus, so is the disciples. This gospel, this story really happened in history, unlike what some people will say nowadays. There's another powerful message in this too. Of all these great powerful political leaders, People of great power, where does the word of God come? Not to them, but to John out in the desert dressed in camel hair. And so, despite the powers of the world, God has his plan of salvation that he is working out. He doesn't need human cooperation. Does he want it? Yes. But his will is going to come no matter what. And so, unlike Pilate, Herod, Caiaphas, who did not respond, those who follow Jesus do. But there's another message, too. And the other message is religious. The word of God coming to John in the reign of Caesar is the same language that all the other prophets of the Old Testament were introduced. For example, in the 13th year of King Josiah, the word of God came to Jeremiah. And so in other words, 
Luke is telling us that the word of God, the prophecies of the old, are now finally being fulfilled in John the Baptist and Christ. Everything salvation, salvation history pointed towards a time when God would come into our world, Emmanuel, God with us, and bring about a new kingdom, peace, love, justice. That is happening now. And so, does this sound like it's a big deal? It's right up there with the greatest powers in the world. It's more important than that. It's everything God has been doing, all pointing to this moment in Jesus Christ. And so Luke's trying to tell us that this is big. And so how should we respond? The answer is repent. You know, we talk about forgiveness of sins, repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and God forgives us our sins even before we repent. He's forgiven us already. But repent is what we do in response to that forgiveness. We accept it, and we allow God this event that has been the biggest in history to change and shape our lives. That's the key. The Greek word they tell me is metanoia, which means change. And so we are called to change in response to this great event. And so Isaiah, in the prophet quoted by John the Baptist, gives us an image. Prepare the way of the Lord. Take the mountains, make them low. The valleys, fill them up. The crooked ways made straight. The rough roads made smooth. You know what this image comes from? In Isaiah's day, roads we take for granted in a modern society. But roads are hard to build and maintain. And so in the ancient world, roads would often go unused because not everyone had a car. But when the king wanted to come into the town, word would go out, a crier, prepare the road for the way of the king. And the whole people would go out there and work as a community to make this road available so the king could come and visit them. Isn't that a powerful image? That's what Isaiah is using. So let's together as a community, an individual in our lives, prepare the way so that the king can come and visit us with his salvation. And so, bring down the mountains. What is it in your lives that are obstacles to God's coming into our, your hearts, our world? What are the things that prevent God from working in your life? I don't know what they are, but you do. For me, it's things like stubbornness, selfishness. Sometimes it can be addiction. It can be materialism, workaholism, consumerism, busyness, video games, TV. I don't know. There are things that we can all identify that are obstacles to God. Let's bring them down. Valleys to be, need to be filled. What might that represent? We need to do more things to bring God into our lives, especially into those holes and emptiness. Things like receiving the sacraments regularly, perhaps more devoutly during Advent, reconciliation, to pray more, to read the scriptures more, to go on a retreat, join a small group, get a daily reflection. What is it that you need to do to bring God more and fill those valleys? Making crooked ways straight. This is just a joke, but are any of you crooked? <laughs> Straighten it out. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Sometimes we're all doing things that we shouldn't be doing. Let's Repent from those and change our ways. But another image for making the crooked ways straight that I like to is oftentimes our life gets a little off track. Don't sometimes we take tangents, even in my own life, but I hear it a lot. You know, I didn't go to church for a while. I didn't pray or I was doing things I know I shouldn't, been, but now I'm coming back. And so we all wander from time to time. Let us take this time to come back to the focus of what our life is most about, following the way of salvation, following the Lord. And make the rough roads smooth. 
don't know about you, but life is difficult. And a lot of us are suffering a rough road, difficult times in our lives. And so let us reach out to one another in our families, in our communities, in our world, and help make their way a little smoother. Acts of mercy and justice, kindness and love, to spread that love of the kingdom because the way is rough in our lives. Let's do a little bit we can to smooth out those ways. And so these are some of the examples that John the Baptist and Isaiah give us. But let me not err and pretend that this work of salvation is our job. God is the Savior. God does this work in us. And so we do these things, but we do them also knowing that it's God who is doing them in us. So we cooperate, prepare the way for that salvation to come into our lives, to bring that light in the darkness, to help us transform. You know, that first reading from the prophet Baruch was written during the Babylonian exile. After their lives were destroyed, their hope extinguished, they were devastated. And God said, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to make it better. And in the psalm, we hear the joy as they're coming back. But you know what? Those same people, 500 years later, in the time of Jesus, had been devastated again, occupied. Our lives are often like that. There's good times, there's difficult times, and it's never quite what we think it is. It's always a work undone. God is still going to come and make it all things right. God writes straight with crooked lines. God brings about salvation, life, from the ashes of our lives. And so whenever we find it's not going like we thought, we just got to trust in God and know uh, and trust that God's promise is going to be better, right? Again, hope is the message of Advent. Hope and joy. We can do these things, but not out of obligation. Do them because we know God is still coming to make all things right. God and that joy that we have when God comes into our lives. Like St. Paul says in that second letter, I pray that the work of God begun in you will come to completion. Let us make that our prayer today. Let us do our best to cooperate and prepare the way of the Lord, but then let go and let God bring us the rest of the way.